Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get into that, I do want to thank you for coming to my channel. I appreciate every single person that comes and watches my videos, and I'm amazed by the growth of my channel. I really appreciate the comments that you make, and I want to thank you. The first item that I have tonight <coughs> is titled, European Politicians Declare War on Text Message Policy. This is an article from Public, and it has some interesting things to say about what's going on in Europe. In recent weeks, Public has documented how ruling European politicians appear to have weaponized government intelligence agencies to discredit and censor their political enemies. Now Public has learned that the European Union is close to winning new legislation that would allow it to monitor all private digital conversations from text messaging to emails. The new law will give EU police the power to read all messages on Gmail, WhatsApp, and other mail and text messaging services. The politicians, who are members of the European Parliament MEPs, say their legislation will be limited to individuals or groups linked to child sexual abuse using reasonable grounds of suspicion. <clears throat> and, they said, to avoid mass surveillance or generalized monitoring of the Internet, the draft law would allow judicial authorities to authorize time-limited orders. <laughs> you know, every time the politicians say, this is just going to be used for this little thing, you know they're lying through their teeth. But the technology companies themselves, such as Apple, say such automatic data scanning is technically impossible without compromising privacy and security. The new law would require Facebook, X, YouTube, Telegram, Snapchat, TikTok, and cloud services and online gaming websites to constantly monitor and report any evidence of child sexual abuse material on their systems and in the private chats of their users and messaging apps including Signal, ProtonMail, and Tutanota would no longer have end-to-end -end encryption. <coughs> Think that's going to fly? I don't. I think the outcry against this will absolutely swamp them. <coughs> Can you imagine? Well, first of all, Telegram is owned, solely owned, by a man who lives in Qatar. Cutter. So, he can basically tell the EU to fly a kite. And there's nothing they can do about it. The only thing they could do is they can force the, uh, uh, I guess it would be Google and, and uh, Apple to remove the app from their platforms. But that'll just generate, that'll, that'll cause Telegram to make the app available some different way. You know that's true. <coughs> They're not going to be able to do it. Uh, and, and plus, can you imagine the, the kickback from users? When users find out that they want to remove encryption from the apps that are encrypted, why do you think that they have encrypted apps? because that's what people wanted. <laughs> and if they wanted them, they had a good reason for wanting them. And they're not going to be happy giving them up, trust me. Several important now, climate communications. Stop. This next one is a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a Prager University. Uh, I don't know what you call these, uh, short, short interview kind of format. It's about five to seven minutes. I think this one is, uh, let's see, it's nine minutes and 10 seconds. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I thought I'd just play a little bit of it for you. The title of this is Judith Curry, Climate Scientist Cannot Intimidate Me. And I thought this woman's story was very interesting.
I was clearly getting under the skin of several important climate communicators. I'm not gonna play games and suck up to these so-called important people just to try to get a pat on the back and advance my career. I'm not gonna do that. My name is Judith Curry, and this is my story. I am a researcher. I'm president of Climate Forecast Applications Network, and I'm author of the new book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk. Well, I grew up in a suburb of Chicago. I was a bookworm. I was an avid reader. I read everything I could get my hands on. When I was in fifth grade, at school, they brought in a geologist. This woman blew my mind. She was talking about ice ages and the mastodons and, you know, all these amazing things that I could hardly even imagine. So with my birthday money, I went out and bought a book on geology. I spent all of junior high sort of pouring through that book, you know, just learning everything I could about the subject. And so I carried that interest really all through my professional career. I went to Northern Illinois University. I was going to major in earth sciences, and I ended up taking a course, Introduction to Meteorology, which is about the weather and atmosphere. And the teacher was so good. I said, okay, this is what I want to do. I liked it better than geology because it had more math and physics in it. And I thought, well, that's what I want to do. I want to combine math and physics with the earth sciences. Then I went on to graduate school at the University of Chicago. When I was an undergraduate, you know, I was the only woman in my class. Women were, you know, very much underrepresented, you know, back in the day, and I'm talking, you know, 1970s. I was definitely in the minority. I had very good advisors who, you know, mentored me very well. But overall, I would say the environment was pretty hostile. The few people clearly didn't want females around. It motivates you to just work really hard and be the best. I received my PhD at the University of Chicago. I've held faculty positions first at Purdue University, then at Penn State University, then at the University of Colorado Boulder, and then finally at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where I served as chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences for 13 years. So I was teaching really a broad spectrum of courses. I was co-author on a paper on the subject of global hurricanes and warming. We found that the percent of Category 4 and 5 hurricanes had doubled since 1970. And this was published shortly after Hurricane Katrina destroyed New Orleans. Some people called me the high priestess of global warming. The environmental advocacy groups were treating me like a rock star, you know. I was flown around on private planes to meetings with donors and all sorts of things. So, I mean, I was very much feted by the alarmist wing, okay, of the climate community. And at the time, I thought the responsible thing to do was to support the UN IPCC consensus on climate change. But that all changed in a big way when a bunch of unauthorized emails were released from the University of East Anglia. Well, they were written by a number of IPCC lead authors, people who were involved in the climate assessment report, and it revealed all sorts of skulldudgery, um, trying to keep data away from other scientists who they thought might criticize them, trying to pervert the peer review process and get editors fired who were publishing papers that they didn't like and trying to ruin people's careers. I mean, it was really some pretty ugly stuff that was revealed and I was horrified. I thought, have I been duped by supporting the IPCC? And I said, no, I can't do this. But most significantly, I spoke up and I said, this is wrong. We have to be more transparent. We have to make our data fully available. We have to clearly describe our methods. We have to be more honest about uncertainty and not overhype with overconfidence. And we need to be respectful of people who disagree with us. 
but the important people in the climate establishment didn't like it at all. Then they came up with the bright idea just to call me a climate denier. I wasn't denying any science. I was criticizing the behavior of a group of scientists who I didn't. <laughs> you can watch the rest of it yourself. It's, it's an interesting uh, story that she has. She went from being a rock star in the climate change community to being an outcast simply because she said, we should be honest about what we're doing. That's, that's all she did. And for that, she was, she became an outcast. It's unbelievable. Uh, the perversion of science over the last decade or two and probably longer, I don't, I'm not that into it. I don't know that much about it. And so I'm likely not privy to all that's been going on, but the part that we can see that's going on now is a complete perversion of science. I got to ask you a question. How comfortable would you be going to get an operation from a woke surgeon or flying on a plane that was flown by a woke pilot? Someone who's not necessarily that well trained, but they're the right kind of person to be hired for that job. Would that make you feel safe? It certainly wouldn't me. This next article is called When Silicon Valley Stopped Trying to Save the World. It's a fascinating article because <clears throat> we've all seen how big tech has been used to censor and to uh, prevent news from getting to the masses. Well, in September 2020, <coughs> excuse me, in September 2020, Brian Armstrong, the CEO of the cryptocurrency exchange platform Coinbase, did something unthinkable in Silicon Valley. He said there would be no politics at his company. Well, you can imagine the firestorm that he faced when he did that. That's why several months after the controversy in September 27, 2020, he published a blog post stating that Coinbase would no longer engage in broader societal issues. It's worth reading his statement in full, but the key takeaways were plain. At Coinbase, he said, we don't debate causes or political candidates internally that are unrelated to work. Expect the company to represent our personal beliefs externally. Assume negative intent or not have each other's back or take on activism outside of our core mission at work. The company even went so far as to offer severance packages to the small percentage of employees who opted to leave because of the new policy. Some 5% of the employees, or about 60 people, took them up on the offer. In the meantime, the entire tech world was up in arms. They were just furious at him, and, and they were trying their best to cancel the company. But... Four years later, he looks like a prophet. That became crystal clear earlier this month when pro-Palestine protesters barged into two of Google's offices, one in New York City and one in Sunny Sunnyvale, California, and refused to leave until the search giant agreed to back out of a $1.2 billion cloud computing contract with the government of Israel. The company didn't give in to their demands. Instead, it called the police. Ten hours after the sit-in began, the protesters were arrested on trespassing charges, and a couple of days later, at least 20, 28 staffers involved with the incident were fired. In a note to employees, CEO Sundar Pichai stated that while Google has a culture of vibrant, open discussion, it is also a place of work. This is a business and not a place to act in a way that disrupts co-workers or makes them feel unsafe. To attempt to use the company as a personal platform or to fight over disruptive issues or debate politics. <clears throat> Pichai said in a memo to staff, this is too important a moment as a company for us to be distracted. What happened? Well, 
<clears throat> there are other reasons for the shift in policy, according to Armstrong. I think Elon Musk buying Twitter also helps shape culture to a degree people haven't fully internalized yet. It's not just Google's atmosphere that has changed, it's the entire industry. It used to be all about sitting on beanbags drinking lattes, said David Heinmeier Hansen, co-owner and chief technology officer of 37 Signals, a software company based in Chicago. But that whole vibe has changed. And why has it changed? Because the industry has had to shrink because they're losing money because of their policies. And so suddenly they're beginning to wake up. So when in April 2021, Freed introduced the new policy to Basecamp's staff, stating clearly, we are not a social impact company. He and Heinmeiner Hansen were berated by many for their position, which one employee labeled as oppressive. Hours after the announcement, several employees quit their jobs, and over the next couple of weeks, about a third of the company's workers took severance packages, which, like Coinbase, Basecamp offered to anyone who wasn't on board with the new rules. Some of those who stayed, like the company's head of human resources, Andrea LaRoe, had to contend with accusations that they were working for Nazis. <laughs> uh -huh. What seemed like a great idea at the dawn of the internet, that tech companies could serve a bigger, better purpose in the world, has become fraught and untenable. <clears throat> Employers don't have to tolerate that kind of behavior anymore, says the former Google employee who asked to remain anonymous. The idea of bringing your whole self to work has turned into bringing your professional self to work. Well, duh. <laughs> Both Freed and Hennemeyer Hansen also used the word relief to describe their reaction to the recent developments at Google. There's a sense of vindication, too. At least one friend who Freed says had turned his back on them in 2021 has reached out to apologize in recent days. <clears throat> but undoing years of inertia in the other direction won't be easy. Mostly, I'm just hopeful that Google turns a corner and is able to get back on track, says Armstrong. I seriously doubt it will happen unless they eat, exit a large number of employees who are pursuing their own agenda rather than the company's mission. <laughs> when I read this stuff, I just think, you know, when I was working, I was working for a company. And the company had goals, and I was supposed to be working towards the same goals the company had, not working against them. And if I did, I wouldn't expect them to keep me, and I wouldn't expect to be paid. But apparently these youngsters that are working nowadays, they think they can do whatever they want, and they still should be paid for it. It's crazy. And it's starting to turn around because the job market has started to shrink, and they've had layoffs, and so who do you think they lay off? The malcontents and the ne'er-do-wells. Those are always the first to go. I mean, that's tr been true for in time immemorial. So, I don't know what they thought they were going to get, but <clears throat> this is what they're getting. Now, this last one, I found... Uh, I guess I'll use the word alarming like the title does. The title is, the FBI found it alarming that Fauci and NIH were funding gain-of-function research. <clears throat> the FBI was tipped off in April 2020 to gain-of-function re virus research in China, funded by the agency formerly headed by Dr. Anthony Fauci. According to emails among FBI agents, the research was to be designed to, quote, leave no signature of purposeful human manipulation. Did you, did you hear what I just read? Here's a, an excerpt from an email. The reason I'm writing, this is an FBI agent, is that the experimental strategy, strategy proposed in AIM-3 infectious clone technology 
It performed using commercial or in-house gene synthesis to prepare the infectious clones would leave no signatures of purposeful human manipulation. So they were trying to create viruses that you could not prove were created by humans. And for what purpose do you suppose they were doing that? <clears throat> you know, I'm not a big uh, proponent of a world court. I think it's an overstep, just like any organization that purports to rule over all of the nations in the world. But I, I'd be willing to make an exemption for uh, an exemption for or exception for Anthony Fauci. I think he should be brought up on charges. Because he, more than any one person, is responsible for the COVID-19 virus and all of the deleterious impacts that that had. Deaths, loss of businesses, loss of incomes, uh, permanent health problems, permanent damage to people's genes. He, he more than any other single person, is responsible for all that. So why shouldn't he have to pay? I don't care how old he is. I don't care how rich he is. Put him in jail. That's where he belongs. That's my opinion. <sighs> As I always do, I will pray for you that you live an abundant life, that you are healthy and that you live a long time, and that God keeps you safe from harm. I pray that he'll do that same thing for every person that you love. And I pray most of all that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Era Vet, out.